We begin with the Battersea Reach from Lindsay Houses from 1863. And to me, this is starting to look more of, of what I think of as being a, a Whistler painting. Again, he's in, he's in England, so you have to imagine there has to be some real influence from Turner there. It's almost impossible to think that he wouldn't have seen his fair share of Turner paintings. Uh, and again, he's painting this hazy mist over the sea. Uh, we have a number of young ladies here in the foreground. And uh, again, when we look at these young ladies, uh, they don't really even, they, they look like they're, they're from Japan as much as anything, especially with the umbrellas. And again, uh, this is the, the beginning or, or the influence of the Japanese prints I was mentioning before. Again, if we look at the horizon line, it's all the way up at the very, very top of the sky. Uh, there's this whole wave of Orientalism or Japanism, uh, as, as it was called, it sweeps through Paris after the International Exhibition of 1867. This was where uh, the country of Japan had actually set up uh, a little pavilion and wares were there and Many artists from Paris and the surrounding uh, area were, went to this uh, exhibition and, again, were very much influenced by what they saw uh, and, and influenced in many different ways. As we will see with Turner, uh, the movement of the horizon line much higher, but uh, in more practical terms, a lot of what they were seeing from Japanese prints uh, was this idea of capturing the everyday, everyday life being worth uh, capturing in terms of art, not just the idea of capturing capturing higher society. Uh, but before this, we have an international exhibition of, of 1862 that occurs in, in London. Uh, this is a, an image, a double, wonderful double image uh, from this. And, and again, just to give you an idea of how much this Orientalism uh, was really affecting Europe, uh, as it says here in Knightbridge, London, they actually had a Japanese village set up from January 1885 to June 1887. Uh, when I say Japanese village, this was probably Probably, if you've ever been to Colonial Williamsburg or that type of thing, this, you know, fake uh, but yet realistic type of feeling, uh, setting up an entire Japanese village for people to come and visit. Uh, and it should be noted that during that time, that it had over a million visitors come out to, to visit this, this Japanese village. But... Um, when we look at the work that we have by Whistler, though, he really kind of precedes some of this. He, he kind of started uh, the Japanism craze, or at least you could say that he was ahead of the game in this. Uh, uh, from this caprice in purple and gold, uh, the golden screen, you can see this is an oriental screen. That is the golden screen. And uh, we have a young woman dressed in the kimono with uh, a nice collection of Japanese prints there on the ground. And if you look at the... Uh, over in the right corner, you'll notice, uh, again, as I mentioned, that horizon line is very, very close to the top of the image, uh, very much like you're going to see in, in Whistler's work. Uh, so this Orientalism really, really is a, a, a major part of, of Whistler's paintings. You see it off and on in, in a lot of the other painters of the time, uh, a lot of the Impressionists, but none quite to the degree that we see with Whistler. Uh, in this one, Purple and Rose, we can see this collection of blue and white uh, porcelain pottery that we know that Whistler was a huge collector of. Uh, this was kind of his bigger hobby. He had a, a, a good friend that was also an artist, and they had uh, a little bit of a competition, you know, rivalry kind of to see who could get the nicest collection. But uh, again, these are authentic pieces uh, that, that he would have gotten at this time, uh, you know, directly from the, the, the harbor there uh, in London. But uh, again, this is what he spent most of his money on, Oriental art. Artifacts, uh, uh, you know, like the carpet you can see underneath as well. All of these objects might be personal possessions of the artist that he set up. Uh, we can see that blue and white style again in the vase here. Uh, Symphony in white number two, Joanna Hiffernan again from 1864. You will also notice uh, that she is holding a fan. Uh, just as a side note, kind of a funny story, the, the house that this was painted in, Whistler's famous house, recently went up for sale, and one of the things that they did mention was that this fireplace from this painting was still intact, so I imagine that uh, it is still intact to this day. But again, 
again. Uh, we see Joanna Heffernan one more time as Whistler's model looking in a mirror, uh, almost forlorn, uh, uh, not quite looking at her reflection, but almost looking at the vase itself. Uh, as I mentioned, we have that oriental fan as well. Uh, he does a wonderful job with the composition using the fireplace. We see her again a few years later, Symphony in White, uh, number three. This would be the third of the series. Uh, here again with another model and uh, once again, we have a Japanese style fan laying on the, on the floor. Here you can see as we progress through these images that Whistler's style in terms of uh, his uh, composition is getting much more complex. Here we have Joanna laying over at, a, at almost a, a, uh, a right degree angle leading to the left and he balances this out with the, the line at the edge of the sofa leading down to the other model uh, who, who is sitting on the floor. Again, creating a, a sense of balance in the composition. Uh, and again, the Symphony in White, naming it after a musical composition with the idea of it uh, being looked at in that way. We have a, a one final image in our lecture here of, of Joanna Hifferman. Hiffernan, excuse me. Uh, she w the, the story goes very simply that she started also modeling for Gustave Courbet. Uh, and if you're familiar with Gustave Courbet's images from this time period, they're pretty racy. So uh, needless to say, what happens is Whistler gets into kind of a, a, a spat with her about this. And this ends the relationship not only uh, with Joanna, but also the friendship that he had formed with Gustave uh, as well. Here, though, in, in in this image, again, we, we can see this wonderful example of, of Whistler's real strength, and that is uh, in line, whether this be a drawing uh, or, an, or an engraving or etching, you can see the points. Uh, the next piece we have is the Princess from the Land of Porcelain, sketch for rose and silver. Uh, and again, this you can see all of the wonderful Japanese motifs almost in one painting. Here we have the kimono and the fans and the screen. Uh, we even have this ceramic vase in the background. Uh, if you look on the left side, this is the painting in situ in the very, very famous Peacock Room. Uh, this will be a painting that will be purchased by a man by the name of Frederick Leland, and it will be installed in a room that will be, of course, known as the Peacock Room, and the wonderful story that, of course, goes with it. Uh, what, it what, what we have here is Leland had actually purchased this painting. He was good friends with Whistler uh, at this time, and he had had this installed within his home. Uh, and he had essentially had this one room and he had designed this room around this oriental theme. He had designed a, uh, an interior designer that was recommended to him by his architect, a man by the name of uh, Jekyll. And uh, essentially what happens is Jekyll is almost finished with this and then he goes sick. Whistler uh, asks if he can step in and finish off the room. Uh, and essentially Leland then goes away on a business trip. Uh, while he's gone, Whistler kind of goes way over bounds here and redesigns the entire room to kind of go around his aesthetic theories of uh, what should be represented with the painting. Uh, I, again, this is what we refer to is a very famous peacock room. You can see the painting there uh, and, and some of the gilded peacocks there also on the right side. Uh, there's also a nice collection of, of uh, oriental ceramics as well. Uh, and again, the whole point of this room was it was supposed to be designed to house this collection of, of art as much as anything. Uh, the Leyland, uh, Leyland had agreed to let Whistler do a little bit, uh, but when he returns, essentially they get into a huge argument because uh, Whistler, as, as I mentioned, had redesigned the entire room and, and uh, had uh, also presented him with an, a, an enormous bill uh, to go along with the shock of the room itself. Uh, one of the things he had done was he had actually painted over some leather pieces that went all the way back uh, to the dowry of Catherine of Aragorn, amongst other things. Here we have the reverse side of the room, and again, a, a, a focus on, on one of these wonderful gilded peacock pieces. 
Uh, so this created a major stress in their relationship, needless to say. Uh, and one of the larger problems was that uh, Whistler had, of course, invested a huge amount of money, his own money, into uh, designing this room uh, and was hoping to recoup it from the bill itself. Uh, so this begins a process of financial problems for Whistler uh, in combination with another event that we're going to see here uh, in just a little bit. He really uh, kind of reaches a point of bankruptcy. Uh, again, this room is very, very famous for the idea that this might be uh, the first time an artist really thinks of, a, of an entire space, uh, kind of a precursor to an art installation. Uh, and very famously, it was said that uh, Whistler had this installed in the room, uh, these two two birds actually fighting with each other, kind of showing the, the, the strain in the relationship between the two people. Uh, and this, of course, causes them to uh, no longer have a relationship with each other. And this is very typical for Whistler. He'll be very close friends with someone, and then he'll get into a, uh, a, a fabulous argument to the point that it will just strain them to the point that they will no longer talk to each other again. And, in any real way uh, that will continue with the history of this room a little bit later uh, but again this causes a lot of problems for, for, for Whistler in terms of his personal finances uh, and this leads to essentially his estate being put up uh, for sale and the very very famous painting the golden scab and if this looks like Leland that's of course done on purpose this painting was supposed to have met them as they opened the doors to his estate uh, and walked in and uh, it, it, its point is pretty simple there. You can see uh, Leyland was actually the creditor of Whistler and was kind of responsible for some of the foreclosure. He's sitting on top of uh, a white house and, and Whistler has his very famous white house at this time. You'll also notice that the colors of the painting are the same colors that were used in the Peacock Room. Again, uh, Whistler just does not respond very well to criticism. Variations in flesh color in green, the balcony from 1865. This is probably one of the more famous ones that he did from this cycle. Uh, we have, you know, a group of models in the foreground and then, but in the background, rather than having an oriental background, we have uh, a cityscape, a very modern industrial cityscape. Uh, this is also one of the first paintings we see the butterflies used very famously by Whistler, most notably in the left corner, you can see two of them. Uh, this will grow on to be one of his symbols as well. Uh, but again, when we look at this, this is a, a very nice piece from this time period because it is a good summation of what he was working on, not only this oriental theme, but also the cityscapes uh, of, of London that he was seeing in the, on the river as well. Uh, Whistler in his studio from 1865. An odd little painting, uh, in my opinion, from this time period. Again, uh, this is more about composition and color than it is about anything else. Uh, it's a very almost surrealistic space. We have this woman in white uh, laying on this couch and behind her you'll notice a, a shelf of white and blue ceramics that again as I mentioned Whistler had a very large collection of and the use of blue in here again it's almost uh, uh, about the color more than it is about the place at this time. Uh, this is, of course, a precursor in my mind to paintings like Matisse's studio.